Hello, and thank you for joining today for my conversation with Julia Phillips, who's one of the five 2020 Young Lions Fiction Award finalists. I'm Zibby Owens, and I'm the host of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books, the podcast. Each year, the New York Public Library's Young Lions Fiction Award champions emerging, emerging writers and recognizes innovation and excellence in contemporary fiction. This year, the award marks its 20th anniversary of celebrating the next generation of outstanding fiction writers. The 2020 Young Lions Fiction Award finalists lists include Steph Cha, Your House Will Pay, Julia Phillips, who's here, Disappearing Earth, congrats, Kylie Reed, Such a Fun Age, Shuan Juliana Wong, Home Remedies, and Brian Washington Lott. You can see interviews with all the finalists at nypl.org slash YLFA. And today I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak with Julia Phillips, who's nominated for her novel, Disappearing Earth. So welcome, Julia. Thank you. Thank you, Zibi. It's nice to be here with you, even virtually. It's nice to be here on the Zoom call with you. It's nice to be on the Zoom call with you too. <laughs> and just one more sentence of background about you for people who might not know. This is your bio, which obviously you know. Julia Phillips is the debut author of the nationally best-selling novel, Disappearing Earth, which is being published in 23 languages and was a finalist for the National Book Award. A Fulbright Fellow, Julia has written for the New York Times, The Atlantic, and the Paris Review. She currently lives in Brooklyn. Okay, that's it. <laughs> now we can just chat. So welcome. <laughs> Tell me about finding out that you were nominated for the Young Lions Fiction Award. What was that like? Oh, it was so exciting. It was so wonderful. I um, am a big fan of this award and this program and the New York Public Library in general. And because of quarantine, I'm afraid I had too much time on my hands to refresh the library's page and Twitter account and think... Um, I wonder when they'll be announcing that this year, just just because, no particular investment or interest for myself, just because. Um, so I spent quite a few weeks uh, sort of pestering the account before I got the wonderful, wonderful news that I was on the list, and it was so exciting. So the Young Lions Fiction Award is now celebrating its 20th anniversary. So do you feel like it means even more in the context of being a part of the anniversary year? What do you think? I, I would buy that, absolutely. <laughs> I got very excited about the 19th and the 18th and the 17th, too, so it's hard for me to see um, it that it would mean so much more right now, but actually, I like the way you put that, and maybe it does. It's much more meaningful now, the 20th. How, yeah. how can you resist that? Totally. That number is irresistible. And it's 2020, so it's like, there we go. We have, yes. like, well, that's great. <laughs> Um, I want to talk a lot about your book, but I also just want to ask if you have an earliest memory of visiting a library. Gosh, a lot of my early memories of visiting libraries um, blend together a little bit into, I think a library was a big after school staple for me of um, doing homework or being dropped off to do homework and not doing homework um, and just reading books in the aisles when I was a little kid. And so all of those sort of blend together into one happy homework shirking memory that, that lasted many years. Um, but I recently found a newspaper clipping from when I was seven that I guess they had a, my public library had a, um, a write your own novel program for kids. So we got these blank books that we filled up with our own stories. And I wrote a very, very plagiarized um, novel <laughs> that I think was the plot of a Christopher Pike book. Um, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if you remember Christopher Pike. I loved, loved it. Like sort of scary teen novels um, about a dead body found in a snowman. So, and I was very supported by that with, in that by the librarians and the staff. They were really loving and, and let me write all sorts of wild, um, plagiarized, half-baked horror stories. They were wonderful. I feel like I will never approach a snowman in the same way again. You never know what's inside. Yeah, you never know. <laughs> Terrifying. <laughs> um, so it sounds like they were really supportive of your development. That's amazing. Um, did they help you find books that maybe set you on this path as well? Or was it more a fostering of your love of writing? It was a fostering, I think, of, of all of our love of writing and a fostering of whatever creative direction we need to go in. I think I spent a particular amount of time illustrating the cover um, and put most of my focus there and, and 
wrote about 40 words in the rest of the book. I think I lost my steam for the story pretty quickly, probably because it had already been written by somebody else better. That has, uh, I mean, the, it hasn't stopped a lot of other people. <laughs> <laughs> so where did you grow up, by the way? Where are we, which, where are we picturing this library that you were in? I grew up in Northern New Jersey, in suburban New Jersey, about 15 miles outside New York. Do you remember the first time you went to the New York Public Library? I know I'm putting you on the spot. I the first time I went to the New York Public Library, but I, rem I have a lot of sharp memories, actually in more recent years, of going to the library um, as a sort of celebratory event. It, it always feels so special every single time. Now I've been in New York for about 15 years, and still every time I go, it feels like the most, um, I don't know, special thing in the world. I think it's the lions outside. It makes it feel very, very special every single time the architecture is so wonderful every room is a mystery and now that now that you're about to have your first baby you can you can discover the children's room which is also really special oh my gosh okay that is on the bucket list okay. for post-quarantine baby life <laughs> take me to, the, to the children's room for sure so now that I know you've been writing since you could basically hold a pencil, tell me about how you got from your first plagiarized novel to, <laughs> to your <laughs> award-nominated Disappearing Earth debut actual novel here in 2020. <laughs> like, what happened in between with all your writing and the Fulbright and all the rest that got you here? I um, always wanted to be a novelist. I was a big reader as a kid, and I was really lucky to be supported um, by some of my early teachers. I, I remember my second grade teacher, especially being super supportive of, uh, um, I was trying to write a novel in a notebook about, I think a girl who was raised by wolves and she, and I would sort of take up all her time reading out loud from this second graders notebook. And she would say like, keep going, that's great. So I really took that keep going, that's great and chose to hold on to it <laughs> very tightly um, and always dreamed of, of writing fiction. I um, ended up studying fiction in college and also studying Russian, which was a big hobby of mine and the language that I love to study. I had been working on a different novel manuscript that I pictured would be my first book and I'm very lucky that it was not and <laughs> that it went into the drawer it went into. Um, and as I was getting to the end of that process, which was quite a few years, I started thinking about what I imagined would be the second book. And I thought, well, maybe I can combine this interest in writing and this interest in Russia and, and set a novel there. So um, with that sort of big plan in mind, I spent a couple of years applying for, for, as you said, a Fulbright, this grant um, in creative writing that would fund my living in Russia for a year and beginning to research a book of fiction. I got that after a couple of years and I moved to Russia and started researching the project that became Disappearing Earth. So that was, that whole process started in 2009 and the book came out in 2019. So it was a, a really educational and challenging and wonderful decade of work on this book. And I'm so glad and grateful to um, have had this project all this time. It's been a really beautiful thing in my life. So do you think it was those words of your teacher that made you not give up? I mean, that's a long time to persist and, and feel that like the project was going to come to a good conclusion. You know, I mean, I feel like giving up might've been a tempting option along the way, but instead not only did you finish, but you crafted this like award-winning beautiful novel. What made you not quit? How did you keep going? Well, it's interesting to think about in the context of the Young Lions Award, because um, I've been learning a lot and reflecting a lot about publishing and about writing and about the sort of creative process um, recently and about youth in the creative process that um, uh, I've been thinking about how in the past, you know, when I wanted to publish a novel at 22 and didn't publish a novel at 22, I thought, oh, there must be something very, very magical about 22 year olds who are publishing a book that must be and maybe there is a magical thing um, or a magical thing about a 30 year old that published it or, but it, it, 
I've been thinking more and more about how integral um, support is in creating speed that um, everyone's writing incredible books. Everyone can write incredible books. Everyone's doing the work, but if you are supported by the people around you, it makes it a lot easier. And that's as true as it is in second grade as it is now you know, when, when you have people around you who say, I believe you can do this. Um, it is motivating and, uh, and really helpful. And God knows you, you don't need the support to do There are so many folks who do the work um, with an, an enormous lack of support. Um, and yet when I look back on my writing ambitions, I really count my blessings in, in how I felt supported by that teacher or supported by my mom who, you know, didn't think it was wacky for me to be studying creative writing or, you know what I mean? Like, um, that, that support was, I think, really huge for me. That's so important. Um, yeah, it's tough to not be supported in basically anything. I mean, having a cheering squad is, uh, can't be underrated, that's for mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> Especially yeah. in writing, which is much more of a solitary profession. So knowing that like once you look up from the, from the keyboard, there are people uh, rooting for you to actually finish, that's, that's a, a huge help. <laughs> it is, and it, and it is a, um, it's, it's a selfish road for me toward uh, arriving at the realization of how important it is to support other, right? You know, that when you find people that you're really excited about or find people that are dreaming of a thing that you're dreaming of or, or have their own, you know, have their own dreams or how little it takes and how much it benefits to say, keep going. I want to support you in this. Tell me how, you know, I want to do everything I can to support you in this because the, that is hugely meaningful to folks. It certainly was hugely meaningful for me. So how do you think you so accurately kind of nailed the voice of the two of the sisters in the beginning of the book? Is there like wandering around the beach and the annoyance of the older sister and all of that was so like pitch perfect as a mother of four children, including two daughters, <laughs> that all of those dynamics, it just seemed so real. Um, so I was, I was, when I heard you were pregnant, I was like, well, she must have older kids too. Cause she totally <laughs> nailed this, but not to say you have to have your own children to write children well, but um, how did you do it so well? What do you think? That's so, that's so kind. And I'm really, that means so much to me that you say that. Cause I, that means a lot to me that you say that. I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, there's so much doubt in the process and certainly their voices took a lot of revision and a lot of talk about support again I mean like and community a lot of feedback from more experienced authors and uh, peer writers and friends who are parents and friends who said you know I remember very very well uh, a wonderful writer named Dion Brand who I had the good luck she read that first chapter and said like why don't you go on YouTube and listen to some kids um Talk, the characters are eight and 11. She said, why don't you go on YouTube and listen to some 11 year olds talking and then revise. And I was like, thank you so much. Um, so absolutely trying to channel their voices or, or get their voices right was a, um, what the, whatever result there is, is a community effort for sure, or a, a community effort to uh, ensure that I was listening closely to how kids talk and express themselves and to each other and not um, just sort of sitting in my own mind fantasizing about a precocious 11 year old who <laughs> is never resentful or I am, I am now thinking that maybe there's a marketplace for kids who want to get job experience helping authors who want to <laughs> perfect their voices you could search by age and just like have a phone conversation with a kid look at that it know. honestly was I, upon reflection, pretty troubling how easy it was to go on YouTube and search 11 year old, you know, yeah. <laughs> <I've been> <laughs> Oh my 
my gosh. Um, so when you were actually doing the writing, obviously you did a lot of research to make sure everything was just right. Um, did you have the whole format outline? Did you have the different people in the community? Like, how did you outline or did you outline or did they, did the characters just come to you? What, what was the driving force of starting the story versus how it ended up? That was a lot of questions, but. <laughs> I love, I love all of those questions. Um, I tried to make as many decisions as possible about the book and the structure of the book and the sort of arc of the book prior to starting writing. Um, I mentioned that I'd previously been working on a manuscript and that manuscript, um, I kind of started with, with a feeling and a tone and a setting and not a story at all, really. And I thought, ah, as I work on it, I'm going to come into the story. I'm going to learn what the story is. And seven years later, I realized not the case, actually, for me that that um, that, that didn't that process, at least with that project, didn't give me clarity um, the more I worked on it. I kind of stayed in the same place where I'd started of having a feeling and no concrete decisions around that. So when I started this project, I wanted to approach it differently. Um, I wanted to make some really sort of strategic choices around its structure, um, who would be speaking and why, what information would be conveyed in each chapter, what the point was. I wanted to have an elevator pitch, uh, which, which I still practice now. I say, oh, you know, the book is about two girls who go missing in the Russian Far East and how that affects the people around them. Two girls who go missing in this remote Russian community and how that affects people around them over and over. I would say this to myself to try to focus on what the book is about. And um, certainly from the start, I thought, okay, it's gonna be over the course of a year. Each chapter is a different month. Um, each focus character is a woman or girl in the community. Um, I really wanted to sort of approach it with as many decisions made as possible. As I got to the end of the writing process, I spent the last six months um, outlining even more heav heavily. I already had, I was a couple drafts in at that point or a few drafts in and yet went back and, and re-outlined all of the chapters and the whole project to try to get more clarity. And I found that every decision I made every conscious decision I could make really helped the work for me. And I find now as I approach new projects, um, as much outlining as I can do in advance uh, helps me a lot, helps me a lot. And then once you sit down to tackle the actual writing, where is like your happy place for writing? Where do you, where do you prefer to write when you can? Um, what do you wear? Like, do you have any, traditions or superstitions when you're writing like or just what does that process look like for you let's see i i don't have a desk so i write in bed or on the couch um i handwrite my first drafts that helps me a lot that's a superstition for sure wow um because i find writing on the computer to be a little bit more i can see i, I pay more attention to what i'm doing in some way and it is more tempting to delete or to go back or I'm a big fan of drafting over and over and over again. So to just get out that first draft really fast and messy is uh, helpful for me to, to do by hand. Um, but these days I'm still, especially, uh, you know, a few months into being inside my apartment walls all the time. It is, I've been thinking about what a happy, writing place looks like and what a productive writing place looks like. And um, I think how much I've taken from changing my setting before and, and, you know, being on the subway or walking around or having things sort of pop into your head. Um, I've been missing that. And I wonder if it is less a specific place and maybe more a, a sort of state of mind or a feeling of movement or engagement with the world that, that helps me a lot. Um, I don't know. So I'm still figuring it out, I guess, is the end. Have you been able to do any writing during the quarantine? I've been doing some writing during the quarantine. I've been really um, motivated and inspired and blown away by some friends who have put together different accountability groups. So like 
uh, every day morning writing session or a once a week like free writing session together or weekly check-ins um, that's been really incredible that being said as you mentioned I'm pregnant like as I get more and more pregnant I f do feel that the fetus is like sucking all desire to move out of me <laughs> and I've been very very unaccountable these days I think you have every excuse in the book I, I love what you're saying because that's what I tell myself in my head as I get very behind on the things I should be doing. No, your body is actually doing like a zillion different things right now that you just can't put your finger on to build another human being. So Maybe. I feel like if you want to take a week to just let your body do its thing, the, you know, the work will follow. It's not like you're going to writing. Well, for the past week where I have done nothing, <laughs> nothing. Um, well, you've yep. done a lot. It's just maybe <laughs> you haven't gotten it on the page. I haven't gotten it on the page. But that's okay. <laughs> There's plenty of time. <laughs> maybe less time once you have a child. But yeah, who knows? yeah maybe different kinds of time. Different kind of time. Yeah. <laughs> um, what, was the, what was it like when you sold your book? Like, what was that moment like after all this time and effort and work? And then you sold it. What was that feeling like? What, what was that experience like? It was the most miraculous experience of my whole life and it and it really that feeling really started um when I got my agent I uh with the previous manuscript I'd worked on it I'd queried 100 agents and I was very focused on the agent hurdle um and spent a lot of time thinking about approaching agents as I was working on this book like a lot of the um, sort of strategic decisions I was making from the start were around how can I better, you know, it's important to me to have an elevator pitch because it's also important to put that in a query letter. Like I was sort of thinking about how I can better position myself in the future for um, developing a relationship with an agent, I hoped one day. And the experience of my agent taking this book on, I will never forget where I was. I'll never forget how it felt. It was like a total, it was like the moment when dream and reality met. You know, like I, I just felt like I passed out of my real life and went into the life I had fantasized about. It was so, I just couldn't, I screamed, <laughs> like jumped up and down. I couldn't, I couldn't handle it. And everything after that felt miraculous in in such the same way you know it was like such it felt like my agent had opened the door and let me into the life that I had dreamed about and it all felt like a dream and it still feels like a, you know if it still feels like a dream um <laughs> I actually I realized that I after a few months like on social media as I was promoting the book as it came out I realized that I kept using that language over and over again. I kept saying, it's, this is like a dream. This is so like a dream. This is dream come true. This is such a dream. And I, and it's hard to get a bit disturbing that I, I was sort of saying like, help me. I have totally disconnected from any sense of reality. <laughs> but, but certainly a lot of, a lot of dreams of my life have come true. And that has been, um, bewildering and magical and, and does feel impossible. Oh, that's so nice. And by the way, if I were your agent right now hearing this, I hope that whoever it is, she, she is listening to this. Um, I would be like swooning. That is so nice. I mean, Suzanne fact, I love her and I tell her every okay. second. <laughs> I'm, sure she, I'm sure she knows. It sounds like you're pretty expressive, but <laughs> still, that's, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> um, do you have any advice for aspiring authors? Yeah, I do. And I don't think, uh, right. My first advice, I guess, would be to be patient with how you've heard this before, because it is not, it's not outrageously novel. Um, but there are three, my, my three go-to pieces of advice are three things that I tell myself over and over and over again, and keep forgetting to act on sometimes. And upon reflection, I think if I just do those things more, um, things would be better, which is write as much as possible, read as much as possible, and um, build a community or 
or embed yourself in an, a creative community. Writing as much as possible just to practice and lower your own inhibitions and sort of unparalyze yourself and see what works. Reading is the best possible education in writing, I think, for which there is no equivalent. And community, it, to me, it seems like, I mean, my book is so much about community, I keep on talking about, but to, to be able to connect to other people and learn from them, learn from their work, cheer them on, be in communication with them about what they're working on, um, to be part of a creative team. And that can be in person or it can be online or it can be you know, on Twitter, it can be like, just to connect with other people in, in, a, in this pursuit of something that is, as you said, Zibi, like can be very isolating and, and is so personal and so strange, this, this, this channel that you're trying to tap into of creativity in yourself. It, it's such a bizarre thing. And to connect with other people through that is um, really the most beautiful and hopeful and inspiring activity you can do it it motivates your work and it makes it much better um in my opinion <laughs> or in my experience for sure that's, that's what I, it's the only person i was asking so you know there. <laughs> the only uh, one i hear from right now the only one, yeah i mean who else uh, not not in my little square um <laughs> i i actually listened to your book instead of reading it usually i read but i i downloaded it and listened to it over um you know a series of trying to actually get out of my house and yeah. run and walk and all the rest. And um, when you have your baby, God willing, everything is, everything is great. And you go one day like on a walk with the baby when everybody is out in the open, I want you to like go back and listen to the first chapter where the, <laughs> and you were going to be filled with this sense of panic that I was filled with uh, <laughs> and like anxiety. So anyway, that's my like little assignment for you at post, post, uh, post childbirth. <laughs> I um in my writing group that helped me so much with this book I remember very well a woman in my writing group reading it she had at the time her two kids were just about the same ages as the two sisters who go missing and she came to the group and she slid the papers across the table and she was like I think your first chapter is pretty effective I will not read any more of this book and I <laughs> Thank you so much. That's best possible feedback. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, when you do that, you have to like DM me or something. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, well, thank you, Julia. Thanks for being a part of this conversation for the Young Lions and your public library and all the rest. So, and congratulations on your nomination and all of your success. Um, well thank deserved. You so much, I, this was so wonderful to get to be in conversation with you. And thank you so much, the New York Public Library one of the best places, if not the best place in the entire world. <laughs>